The Bible Treasury. A monthly magazine of papers on scriptural subjects. Volume 17, Article 15, 1888 and 1889. Part 1. What Jonah Learned in the Fish's Belly? Chapter 2. Jonah During the Storm. The first two chapters of the book of Jonah teach us two all important truths. In the first, we learn that there is no place, however likely for escape, where God's arm cannot reach us. The second chapter shows us that there is no prison, however unlikely for escape, from which God's hand cannot deliver us. What place more suitable for escape than the wide endless sea? If the criminal wants to escape from the hands of justice, he embarks for some distant country. God knows how to overtake thee, fugitive, who, Jonah like, desirest to go thine own way, and to flee from the presence of the Lord. And where in this world could a prison be found from whence escape appears to be more impossible than the fish's belly at the bottom of the sea? Do not despair, prisoner. To God, it is but a small thing to deliver thee from the strongest prison, as soon as it seems good to him, and he has accomplished his purpose in placing thee there. Perhaps some might say that Jonah, as the Lord's prophet, ought to have been too intelligent, and God-fearing, to make the vain attempt to flee from the Lord's presence. Let us not deal too hardly with the prophet. Have not we like him attempted to go westward when God has told us to go eastward? Jonah was a prophet of God, but are we not children of God, greater than Jonah, yea, greater than John, the forerunner of the Lord? Matthew 11 verse 11. And have we not had to experience to our sorrow and shame, how vain such attempts are, but also how near is God's hand in deliverance to those who call on him out of the prison of self-inflicted distress, as soon as we, in the fish's belly, had learned the lesson God was teaching us there. Alas! How often have we followed, like Jonah, the promptings of our natural will, forgetting the truth so important for the practical life of faith, as expressed in Psalm 139, and which written by David nearly 150 years before Jonah, must surely have been known to if now forgotten by him. Let us turn to the first half of that instructive psalm. 1 O Lord, Thou hast searched me and known me. 2 Thou knowest my down-sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. 3. Thou compassest my path and my lying down. And art acquainted with all my ways. 4. For there is not a word in my tongue. But, lo, O Lord, Thou knowest it altogether. 5. Thou hast beset me behind and before. And laid Thine hand upon me. 6. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain unto it. 7 Whither shall I go from thy spirit? On whither shall I flee from thy presence? 8 If I ascend up into heaven, thou art the. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, thou art the. 9 If I take the wings of the morning. And dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. 10 Even the shall thy hand lead me. And thy right hand shall hold me. 11 If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me. Even the night shall be light about me. 12 Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee. But the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the night are both alike to thee. It was just these searching truths which Jonah practically forgot when trying to flee from the presence of the Lord. God, who willeth not that a sinner should die in his sins but repent and live, had commanded his prophet to go to Nineveh with a message of warning from the wrath to come. Nineveh was then the first and greatest city of the world before Babylon rose into prominence. Its vices and wickedness had attained such a height, that it had come up before God. It is a solemn truth, reader, that sin has a voice, which cries to heaven for God's righteous retribution. The word of God, both in the Old Testament and to the New, confirms it. God says to Cain, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood creeth unto me from the ground. God then pronounces judgment upon Cain. To Abraham, the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now, and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come unto me, and if not, I will know. Further, in the New Testament, behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, creeth, 
and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabbath, James 5 verse 4. In the same way, the cry of Nineveh's wickedness had come up before God, and he had commissioned his prophet with a message of gracious warning to that city. But how did the messenger entrusted with such a gracious charge receive it? He little thought of the weal or woe of those millions of sinners at Nineveh, for whose reproof and salvation that message had been designed. His first thought is of his own position, and whether the consequences of that message might not contribute to impugn his character as a prophet of God. In the end, chapter 4, he himself unwittingly betrays his selfish thoughts that led him into disobedience in the foolish attempt to flee from the presence of the Lord. He appears to have reasoned somewhat thus, God must have gracious intentions toward Nineveh, in charging me with this message of warning. And in thus sending me to them, Jehovah, no doubt, will invest my words with divine power and conviction, and the nine vites will turn from their evil works and repent. God then on his part will reap and of the judgment announced to them by me, his prophet. I know that he is a gracious and pitiful God, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth himself of the evil, Jonah 4 verse 2. He will pardon the city, and I, Jonah, Jehovah's prophet, shall be exposed as a lying prophet, the judgment announced by me, not having been carried out. Has not Jehovah himself spoken by Moses thus, but the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. And if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. The temptation in Jonah's case was not small, but where was his faith? Where his trust in God, and the single iron heart in simple obedience of faith? Was not God, who had charged Jonah with the announcement of judgment upon Nineveh, able to take care of the character of his prophet? When the judgment, announced by Jonah, did not take place on account of the repentance of the Ninevites, did they consider Jonah to be a false prophet? Not so. They were but too glad and thankful, that they had been pardoned and spared. Oh, what a wretched and mischievous thing is self, wherever it lifts up its ugly head, especially in the Lord's work and service. Rather let Nineveh perish with its millions of souls than the personal character and ministry and position of a prophet of God be impugned. Alas! Worse than this, rather let the flock of God, for whom the Good Shepherd died, be scattered to the winds and become a prey to wolves, who do not spare the flock, than a distinguished luminary in the church confess, that he in some important church matter has made a mistake. The history of the church down to the most recent days bears testimony to the sorrowful fruits of such unjudged selfishness, self-will, and pride in some, who were looked up to as servants of the blessed Lord, who is meek and lowly of heart. Oh, may we in the crushing sense of our nothingness, learn to be small before him, who is the great I am in God's presence, once the lowliest of all servants, taking the lowest place upon the earth, and therefore exalted to the right hand of God from whence he will appear as Lord of Lords and King of Kings, to judge this world. May we learn better to understand his ways and to enter upon them. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not hither, but watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Was not Jonah's errand a proof of it? Let us now return to him. God had told Jonah to go to the east, to Nineveh, with that solemn yet gracious message. But Jonah goes just the opposite way. He goes to the west, to Joppa, taking ship for Tarshish to flee from the presence of the Lord. Thrice in our chapter, as thrice also in the first, does the Holy Spirit make mention of the prophet's vain attempt to flee from the presence of the Lord, as if to point out the folly of such an attempt. The town of Joppa has in this sense a very instructive significance. Two servants of the Lord, the one a prophet and the other an apostle, went to that place. 
Both were entrusted by God with a message to the Gentiles, the prophet of the Old Testament with a warning message of judgment, and the apostle of the New with a message of salvation, grace and peace through Jesus Christ. The prophet went to Joppa in disobedience to the will of God, but the apostle under the guidance of the Spirit. Both of them had in their gracious master's school to be trained for their service. Hard were the lessons which each of the two had to learn, but those destined for the prophet were the hardest by far, for in his case it was not the consequence of mere ignorance, but of willful disobedience. Peter, on the roof of the house of Simon the Tanner, learnt by the vessel descending from heaven, like a great sheet knit at the four corners, an all-important lesson from heaven, before he left Joppa for Caesarea, to convey to the first fruits of the Gentiles the heavenly message of peace through Jesus Christ but for Jonah too much harder though blessed lessons were reserved, which he had to learn at the bottom of the sea in the belly of the fish after he in disobedience had sailed from Joppa to flee from the presence of the Lord. What lessons? How different in their character and locality, and yet so rich in grace and blessing in their intentions and results. None can hinder what he will. Wait and trust in him, be still. Go the way which he doth send thee. Sure and blessed will the end be. The storm sent by God now broke out. It must have been of extraordinary violence, for the ship was like to be broken. Even the mariners, accustomed to storms, were frightened and cast forth the ways that were in the ship, into the sea, to lighten it of them, and cried every man unto his God. But where was Jonah? Gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay, and was fast asleep. Amidst the storm, when everyone, from the captain down to the cabin boy, is wide awake and astir, the prophet lies fast asleep. And why? His conscience began to awake, and he wanted to sleep it off, and he succeeded. Alas! How deep is the torpor of a conscience lulled to sleep by Satan, the world, and the flesh, be it the conscience of a saint, who has departed from the path of obedience, walking in willful disobedience, or that of a backslider. Only in the latter case, his sleep is heavier and deeper and generally of longer duration. That solemn warning of the Apostle in his epistle to the Ephesians, Ephesians 5 verse 14, is addressed to believers, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Solemn words these, addressed to Christians, careless Christians. They resemble a man who has laid himself to sleep in a dead house among corpses. What a situation to be in! Who but a madman, or a drunkard, would think of laying down to sleep in a dead house? The first part of the above solemn call is, Awake thou that sleepest. So it was with Jonah. The Gentile captain of the ship must come and rouse him from his sleep with these words, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us, that we perish not. What mortifying words addressed by an unconverted man of the world, as happens sometimes, when collaring a Christian out of his sleep? Can there be anything more humbling for a child of God? Alas, to how many a Christian, who has left the path of obedience, to walk in self-will and worldliness, has that solemn call been addressed, Awake thou that sleepest! But like the sluggard, who when roused in the morning, only turns himself upon his side, and soon is faster asleep than before, so have you, poor Christian worldling, what a contradiction in terms, when half roused from your perilous sleep but relapsed into a deeper one. You have heeded only the first part of that awakening call, regardless of the second, arise from the dead. Your unwilling ear did not listen to this second clause, and you have relapsed into sleep and slept even faster than before in company of the dead, amidst whom you have made your bed. This reminds me of a most affecting account I read some time ago of the death of a little girl about eight years old. On passing one evening a cemetery she perceived through the railings some pretty flowers on some of the graves. She wanted to take a few of them. The gate being open, she entered and picked them, but in taking them she was caught by the sexton. Several graves having been lately despoiled of their floral ornaments, for whose preservation the sexton was responsible. The wretched man determined this time to inflict exemplary punishment. He seized the poor crying little maid, and dragged her into the dead house, where several dead bodies were lying, and locked her in, intending to leave her there for an hour. He then returned to his work. Being very busy that evening, and having several calls to attend to, 
He returned home late, and worn out and tired soon went to sleep, having entirely forgotten his prisoner in the dead house. In the morning he suddenly bethought himself of the poor victim of his cruelty. Terrified he hastened to the dead house and opened the door. But what a sight presented itself to the wretched man. The number of the dead bodies had increased by one. Cowering down in the farthest corner sat the poor little maid, dead. Her lovely childish little face was distorted with terror. In her lap lay still the small nosegay, culled from the grave. The cold, the atmosphere of death and corruption, and above all the fright at the presence of the corpses, had soon put an end to her young existence. When the inhuman perpetrator of that barbarous deed was taken to prison, the numerous police were scarce able to prevent his being lynched by the furious crowd. I have not mentioned this terrible incident, to produce a sensational impression upon the Christian readers of these pages, which would be neither profitable nor edifying for them. But should there be even one amongst them who has practically forgotten the purification of his sins, and gone to sleep in the dead house of the world, perhaps the sad incident mentioned above may be to him a serious warning in its proper application? Poor, thrice unhappy, worldly-minded child of God! You are in a far more terrible position than the poor little maid just spoken of. She knew but too well in what place and company she was, in the dead house amongst corpses. But you scarcely appear to be conscious that you are in the same place and company, only spiritually, which certainly does not improve either the place or the company. She felt the terrible atmosphere of death and corruption in that dead house. But to you, that pestilential savor of death, stifling the spiritual life, has become your natural atmosphere. She, poor little captive, felt the darkness of that terrible night there without a morning. The silence of death was awful to her, and the least noise in that chamber of the dead would have frightened her still more unless it had been the noise of approaching footsteps without. Oh, how the poor little captive at such a sound would have sped towards the door, calling out for deliverance. And if the door had been opened, would she have delayed a moment longer in her terrible prison? No, with winged steps she would have fled from the pestiferous cage of death into the fresh open air, thanking God for her deliverance from that terrible abode. But you, poor unhappy strewer from the grace of God and of his Christ, have settled down in this world, where everything bears the stamp of sin and death and made your bed with the dead in trespasses and sins. Instead of going into the world, whither the Lord has sent you, as the Father sent him into it, a faithful witness of the truth, and carrying with you the savour of the gospel of life and peace for your fellowmen, you have embarked with the world, whose friendship is enmity against God, in the way of disobedience. You have forgotten that the cross of Christ which has removed every barrier between God and you, ought to be an everlasting barrier between the world and you, the world being by it crucified unto you, and you unto the world. Like Jonah, you have gone into the sides of the ship to sleep off the storm, the trouble of your conscience. Beware, Christian worldling. God does not always send an outward storm, as in the case of Jonah. Do not close your ears and heart to the voice of God, which not only is mighty upon the waters, but speaks mightily to the conscience and heart, by his spirit and word, lest you should fare like some of those at Corinth, who, from their spiritual sleep fell into the sleep of death. It is indeed far better to depart and to be with Christ, but it is sad very sad, to fall in the wilderness by God's chastening hand. To be called home in such a way, cut off like a barren fruitless branch, is a sad way of going home. Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. That is, awake, rise and open the shutters of your dark chamber of death like sleep, that the sun may shine in, and Christ give you light. And should there be in your heart some secret idle chamber, be it love of money, or worldliness, or something else which has slipped in between Christ and you, and taken his place in your heart, open the door and let the light of Christ and his word shine in and expose the idol in all its hideousness, and in the morning light of our good shepherd's restoring grace, Degan's stump and members will be seen scattered about. Your eye being light again and single, set on Christ, your whole body will be light and your heart shall bask in the sunshine of the love of the Father and of the Son, in the power of his Spirit no longer grieved, who glorifies Christ, receives of his and shows it unto us. It was not so with Jonah. The storm and the Gentile shipmaster had shaken him out of his sleep, but his conscience had not yet been fully roused. 
for this something more was needed. Even these Gentile mariners appear to have recognized the extraordinary character of that storm. They felt that a higher hand was here at work, to reach some unknown sinner sheltered by them. They, therefore, cast lots to learn for whose sake that disastrous tempest had come upon them. Instead of finding an Aachen in the camp, we have a Jonah in the ship. And as in the former case, so here the lot fell upon the right man, Jonah. Now his conscience, as well as his body, is fully awake. At the question, tell us, we pray thee, for whose sake this evil is upon us? What is thine occupation, and whence comest thou? What is thy country, and of what people art thou? He answers, I am a Hebrew, and I fear Jehovah, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land, and confesses to them his sinful and vain endeavor to flee from the presence of the Lord. Even the Gentile mariners see the folly of Jonah's attempt to flee from the presence of his God, and the prophet has to listen to the humbling question, Why hast thou done this? But God's purpose had not yet been reached by the prophet's confession, wrung from him by the convicting lot, Jonah must be sent to his destination in the belly of the fish at the bottom of the sea, but to learn in God's house of correction, what God would teach him. The storm of the sea continued to rage, and the terrified mariners asked Jonah, what shall we do unto thee, that the sea may become unto us? Jonah now submitted to the mighty hand of God. Whatever may have been his other personal shortcomings, he was no coward. He tells them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea become unto you, for I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. We now come to a lovely feature of these Gentile mariners. Although they owed to Jonah all their trouble and distress, and even the loss of the whole cargo, as well as their evident jeopardy, they nevertheless hesitate till the last moment to avail themselves of the only means, indicated by the prophet himself, of saving them, by throwing Jonah overboard. Nevertheless they rode hard to bring the ship to the land. How many Christians mariners in the ecclesiastical barge might take a leaf from the book of these rough Gentile sailors, in cases where there is, we do not say, an Uachan in the camp, but, a Jonah in the ship. Here we not in such cases but too often the cry, overboard with him? Let us throw him into the sea, that the sea may become unto us is, when translated into church language, let us excommunicate him, that we may be no longer troubled. Such oarsmen will flatter themselves in vain with the hope that, after Jonah's ejection from the ship, the sea will be calm unto them. Generally just the opposite will occur. Nay, it often happens, that not the one who was believed to be the Jonah in the ship, but one or some of these unhesitating mariners get somehow into the fish's belly, and to the bottom of the sea, in order to learn of the lessons which they had thought to be reserved for Jonah. These honest and gracious Gentile mariners endeavored, if possible, to save Jonah, and the ship, and themselves. But their efforts, however well meant, were in vain. God's wise, holy, and gracious will and purpose as to his prophet must be accomplished. But these mariners, we can hardly call them any longer unconverted, did not proceed with the execution of the prophet's own behest, till they had bowed down before Jehovah for what they were about to do to his prophet. How beautiful and instructive is their short prayer, we beseech thee, Jehovah, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, Jehovah, hath done as it pleased thee. They then take Jonah and throw him into the sea. Immediately the storm ceases, and the sea becomes calm. Then the men feared Jehovah exceedingly, and offered a sacrifice unto Jehovah, and made vows. The voice of the Lord upon the waters had not only spoken to Jonah, but also to the Gentile mariners, who, like the Thessalonians of a later day, turned to God from idols, to serve the living and true God. They were thus a type of the Gentiles, who, after the tempest of Jacob's trouble is over, shall turn to God. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. But before entering upon the next chapter, let us pause a few moments to consider one greater than Jonah, even Jesus, likewise during the storm.